Good afternoon and uh, welcome to this uh, closing plenary of our two-day conference. Um, we thought the best way to conclude, uh, in addition to closing the doors so that whoever doesn't want to join in, they at least don't disturb us. So let's close the doors there. We thought the best way uh, to try to conclude our deliberations over the last two days would be to ask a selection of participants from a wide spectrum of experiences uh, to reflect on what we have learned from the rich discussions that we've had. And um, I would like to thank you very much, Professor Ravi Kanbur, Professor of World Affairs, International Professor of Applied Economics and Management, Professor of Economics, University of uh, Cornell University, and also a wider board member. I'd like to thank very much Blandina, Gillam, a researcher, policy research development rapport in Tanzania. Professor Santiago Levy, Vice President of the Inter-American Development Bank. Thank you very much, Christina Kuvaya, Director, Unit for Sectoral Policy in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Finland, also a wider board member. Smirti Sharma, Researcher, New Delhi School of Economics. And Professor Ernest Ayiti, Vice Chancellor of the University of Ghana and Chair of the wider board. Now, the sequence uh, is very simple. That's just to help me remind in which order you're speaking. Uh, there is uh, absolutely no other than that behind the order in which you're seated. But the three questions that we pose to you are the following. Uh, what is the one key message you take home for policymakers from this conference? And second, what lessons did the conference hold for the use of research in creating better development policy? And third, what idea or country experience discussed in the conference most surprised you? So a take-home message for policymakers, a take-home message for research, and maybe something that actually surprised you or you didn't know or you felt, wow, there was something there. But these are really only just opening questions. They're just really to get our conversation going. Uh, so f feel free to add in, deduct, or say whatever you find you need to say. Um, we requested you to be relatively brief. We, we would also like to open up for the opportunity that other people uh, can join into the conversation. So it'd be good to be uh, relatively brief. It's fine to make some succinct statements, and then we will, we will open up. So, Ravi, will you go first? Uh, thank you. So I, I, I think we really should uh, allow members of the audience to, uh, <clears throat> uh, to speak. So I'll be very, very uh, brief. Uh, a key message for uh, policymakers that I was struck by, because there are many, uh, it really came to me when uh, Seppo uh, Honkapoya was speaking about financial deregulation in Nordic countries. Be very, very careful about financial deregulation. Uh, I know with the crisis, and so on, whenever these crises hit, we are very careful. <laughs> and then five years after those, we start becoming less careful, and I think that's extremely important. And the second question that <clears throat> follows on from that is, if, if, we, if we're being told to be very careful about financial deregulation, then what about other types of deregulation? Uh, should we go jump headlong into labor deregulation uh, straight away in a big bang way? What, what does financial deregulation have to teach us about that? So that's my, the first one. Use of research in creating <clears throat> better development policy. I think we should really be asking Santiago Levy, who has uh, used research, so I won't say, I won't say very, much, uh, 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 very much about that, except to say that in my experience, uh, it's, it's pretty much random, okay? The, in, in my experience of advising policymakers and so on, you have to be at the right place at the right time uh, and have that right uh, one pager uh, ready, uh, and that's when it, that's when it, it works. So it, it, it's, 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 the, it's the hit and miss of it which, which has struck me in my time as, as policy advisor. Um, <clears throat> what idea or country experience surprised you most? Uh, I hope you'll forgive me for... Uh, giving some of, my, some of my own research, but it wasn't presented by me, but by, by, Harun, by Harun Porat. Some work that we've been doing on minimum wage and employment effects of minimum wage in South Africa, for, uh, for agriculture, we find very big effects. Uh, and for seven other sectors other than agriculture, we find very low effects. Uh, and so when we present these to policymakers, as Harun said, uh, they love one, they love one uh, result, but they don't love the other results. 
So talk about, talk about country specificity, this is sector specificity, the same, the same uh, uh, intervention, We're using the same econometric methods, et cetera. We get zero effects in a series of six sectors and very big effects in agriculture. Why? Okay, thank you, Ravi. Glendina? Thank you, Finn. Uh, the key message that I got from uh, the conference uh, actually is making policies is not very tough. The biggest uh, uh, challenge that we all have is how we implement. And this came from the presentation by Lan Pritchard. And within that, uh, the messages that also came through were we should try as much as possible not to go for shortcuts, not mimic anything that we are doing. Just because we see an institution elsewhere, we got a lot of examples here, uh, it will be difficult to replicate what is happening without uh, considering um, the different steps that you have to undergo, and there shouldn't be any shortcuts. Um, lessons for years of research? So for me, um, the biggest part was, I've been in policy, uh, policy research uh, institute for, uh, for a while. And I said, okay, maybe we also have to change our name because already we have to show that we are working towards um, implementation. And the surprise that I got, um, I will join Ravi in there, and for me it was the Nordic countries, the crisis. I was like, whoa, I didn't know it was that close. Yes, I was very young, but 1988 didn't sound very far to me. But then here we are now, we're already talking about 2007 and the things we're just uh, repeating. So we need to learn from history. I thought that's what I picked up. Thanks. Thank you, Blandina. So, Santiago, Ravi already kicked a rather major ball to you. <laughs> um, thank you. So, so on, on the first question of sort of the key policy message, uh, a little bit along Blandina's line, uh, the notion that Importing policy will not do, I think, is really a central policy message that I would bring to policymakers. Um, you know, general recipes don't work. You really have to look at the institutions of the country. You have to look at the legal framework of the country, both, as Kaushik was saying yesterday morning, along sort of the formal institutions and the de facto or social norms. You have to understand why what worked in another country may or may not work in your country. And certainly there's some useful lessons from other countries in terms of how agents reacted to different incentives, but agents in your country might react to the same incentives in a different way because the institutions or the local customs or the local norms are different. So, so merging those two things, I think, is sort of an art, and that's why I think development is so difficult. So, so that's the first question. On the second one, I, I think sort of Ravi said it, it's sort of random. If you if there is a policymaker who wants to listen and there's a policymaker who wants to be guided by empirical evidence and, and not with a precondition, pre of, you know, a view that he already has, and he's just looking for somebody to justify what he wants to do as opposed to somebody who's truly asking, you look, I, I don't really know how to deal with this problem. Can I get some policy advice? Uh, there, I think, what we need to do, I think, as researchers is be a little bit more precise with the language. Um, the, the same words mean so very many different things to different people. If, if you use the word industrial policy, that means different things for different people. So you've got to be a lot more precise. And then they generate reactions, good or bad, one way or the other. The same thing with social safety nets, the same thing with informality. These are words that we use continuously. And, and even though they're the same sequence of letters, the person listening on the other side as you use these words, is, is having a different image of what you're saying. So much more precision in the language. And lastly, what surprised me the most? Um, on the same line, I learned a lot about South Africa, both from the presentation by Francis and, and from the presentation by Haroon. I, I didn't realize that the problems were so deep, so complex, so much more difficult than in other areas. So it opened my eyes I, 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 you know, how, how, how extremely difficult a history they have. It was an eye-opener for me. Thank you, Santiago. Christina? Uh, thank you very much, Finn. Um, uh, first and foremost, what to take home as a key message for policymakers, and actually that addresses myself to a certain extent. Um, 
maybe I, I want to just be more precise, uh, a policymaker in a donor organization. I think that there were, there were two issues that I think many of the presentations addressed. And these were accountability and national ownership. Um, what, I, what I gathered as a key message was, was that transformation, inclusion and sustainability can take place in a meaningful way if uh, they are based on a shared understanding on where we are going and if there are clear accountability mechanisms on the steps that are, have been taken or are to be taken. Um, this, the shared understanding is created by national ownership. And when I mean national ownership, I, I don't mean only the state institutions, but the different stakeholders and the dialogue and the negotiation that has to take place to enable genuine national ownership on, on the transformations. Now the use of research, here I would have a very generic observation, um, which a little bit goes along the lines of Santiago, but again, from the perspective of the, of the donor organization. I would say that the, the, the key uh, lesson or the message that I am taking home is actually the, the use of evidence and analysis in decision making. And why am I am saying this? Um, in the donor community, there is currently a huge pressure to show results to taxpayers. And there is a certain risk for us to go for easy fixes and quick results. And I think that the deliberations of this conference have emphasized that the evidence and the interpretation of the evidence is the key when we want to aim for meaningful results. So this is something that, that I, I, I take from there. And then finally, the, the idea or the, the country experience that sort of surprised and enlightened me, obviously, I'm, I'm not an economist, so there were 10 different I ideas. I, I do agree with Santiago that as a, as a country experience, South Africa and, and, and really the complexity and the depth of the challenges was something that, that was very enlightening uh, to me. I also enjoyed immensely the, the, the discussions on the, uh, the transitional nature of employment and the preconditions for that and, and the fact that unemployment as such is not enough. I mean, there's much more, more into it. And then finally, maybe the third one was in the very beginning of the conference when, when Basu was was discussing the interplay of laws and, and social norms, I found that very sort of intriguing. And I, and I think that there were many additions during the, during the conference into his presentation that, that emphasized the power relations, the social space. And there were even some references to the, so the, to the spatial organization of our societies and how that interplace with uh, economic dynamics. Okay, thank you, Christina. Smriti? Um, thanks to Finn and Tony for inviting me to be a part of this conference. You know, it's not every day that PhD students like myself get to be a part of a conference like this discussing these big development ideas and being on panels with such esteemed researchers. So I'm really grateful to be here. Um, so. I think with all the sessions I attended, there were these key takeaway lessons uh, for a country like India that I felt like I could go back and, and tell that to policymakers. But of course, a few handful of lessons that I would take back that, re that resonate with my own research interests would be, firstly, there was uh, some mention in Martin Rama's talk about um, skills being a problem. So while jobless growth is a problem that's plaguing a lot of economies, another sort of second order problem uh, that needs to also be given considerable attention is that of skill shortages with employers in a lot of developing countries now saying that young graduates who are entering the labor force are not equipped with the necessary skills, whether it's technical or interpersonal. And particularly for a country like India where a huge proportion of the population is now entering into the working age uh, group, uh, these are issues that are going to uh, require attention. And I thought that that's something uh, that going forward uh, would be a really interesting area to look at. 
The other thought that I had was um, that often the issues of structural transformation and social inclusion are are at odds with each other, and you know we find various examples of this. So, for instance, in the 1980s, when Bangladesh uh, experienced trade liberalisation, and there was a major expansion in the ready-made garment sector, which now contributes heavily to their exports and employment and GDP, uh, women uh, got included in the labour force, and they constitute more than 80% of the workforce in that sector. But the point is, at what cost, and has it led to an empowerment uh, of the female? Uh, status in general, in terms of their wages or just voice or the working conditions that they face. So I feel that that's an important, again, policy question uh, going forward, that how do you resolve this tension and how do you achieve more broad-based social transformation that can also be inclusive of all groups in, um, in society. In terms of um, issues uh, that surprised me the most, um, again, the South African uh, case was, was really interesting for me, like uh, Christina and Santiago mentioned. I was aware of some of the racial literature coming out of South Africa, but not in terms of the landscape uh, when it comes to labor markets. And uh, the sustainability literature is something that's really new to me, and, and that's something that I'm looking to uh, learn more about. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Smriti. And Ernest, will you conclude this one? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think the, the uh, biggest message that I'll be taking home is the fact that uh, institutional reform is a lot more difficult to pursue than uh, simply uh, doing policy reform. And th the main reason being that uh, with the policy reforms, uh, you, you require strong institutions to be able to in pursue these uh, properly. So we've seen many policy reforms that uh, have not been properly implemented. That came up quite clearly in Lan Pritchard's uh, last talk. So the challenge is how to pursue uh, reform with a view to developing the strong institutions that can actually implement policy. Uh, many developing countries talk about doing institutional reforms, but never really get to grips with it because it is a multifaceted thing that uh, requires a lot of thinking through. Which takes me to the uh, question of uh, research. What kind of research ideas uh, are coming out of this conference? Uh, the, the most important thing is uh, why is this so different from place to place? We, we've heard uh, everybody talk about uh, the need to ensure that local solutions are obtained for local problems. Uh, to do this effectively, it means you must understand the local conditions. Uh, why are governments in Africa in many developing countries not spending enough on doing the research that uh, will bring about these local solutions to the and look at problems. So my take on it is uh, uh, African countries, African governments, uh, developing country governments need to invest more in their local research in order to find the local solutions that will be applicable to the uh, local problems. What ideas surprised me most? Uh, well, there are so many different ideas coming out of this. Uh, as everybody has also said, the uh, Development challenges that you find in Ghana are not much different from what you find in South Africa or in Mali or in uh, Bangladesh. These are fairly uh, similar development challenges. No water, poor irrigation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And yet the solutions are so different from place to place. Um, so we, we, we heard about the South African labor situation, which everybody has talked about. It's a fairly common situation in that part of the world, but it's also fairly common across the region. But everybody knows that the way to solve the South African problem <laughs> is vastly different from the way you can solve the labor problems of Ghana. So these are things that uh, may not be surprising. Uh, they become surprising when you begin to think about how to solve the problems. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ernest. The idea now is that anybody who wants to kick in, react, Suggest, did anybody feel provoked? You want to concur? So, who wants to go first? Don't be shy. Yes, okay. We go to Tanzania. The panel has done a great job. That's why we, we are quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Not because it's Friday afternoon or, no, no, no. or something like that. Yes. But uh, two no, things which uh, okay. I would like to to add, uh, I very much uh, support the colleagues who emphasized the point about uh, specificity. 
by country. Uh, what I learned uh, in that regard is the importance of uh, specificity in terms of localities within our nation states. When we discuss policy uh, prescriptions, policy reforms, we, most of us actually end up at the national level. But uh, we have shown that uh, within one nation state, there is such a variation in uh, uh, local uh, steps which can be taken to achieve results. Uh, and I think that to me is, uh, is uh, an important lesson that within the country, local uh, authorities, local provinces have a lot to do to uh, achieve uh, results. Um, a second um, point which I would like to emphasize is that the, which I got from the discussions, a number of interventions in uh, um, policy action do not necessarily need budget, money. Uh, they need understanding and doing business differently. Uh, because often uh, when proposals are made, the question which comes is budgetary implications, where is the money? Uh, so I think the lesson which comes out is so much more can be done by understanding the situation and interventions do not necessarily have to require money. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, we go on this side. Please say who you are. Yeah, my name is Olawale Ogunkola from Nigeria. The message I can take home is we are dealing with a complex issue when you take institution or institutional reform. And therefore, we need to balance many interests in terms of stakeholders. We need to go back to history, if possible. And we need to also be sensitive to the norms of the society we are dealing with. So it's no longer economics, a little bit of history, a little bit of sociology, a little bit of psychology is the only way that we can achieve uh, effective reform that will lead to transformation. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. That was on specificity. That was on the interdisciplinarity. We need to draw on all disciplines. There's one down. Uh, let's, let's start up here in the front. Let's start up here with Justin. And we move. Yeah, I, I think that in terms of takeaway for me, the most important one is Celestine's presentation. Certainly we all know it would be good for a country to have good governance, good infrastructure, good education, transparency, all those things. And uh, we have been obligated that for a long time. But if you look at historically, most of the developing countries, they started to take up at a certain point of time, and they did not have any of that. And so it is a challenging you know, issue to us, because if you want to help a developing country and to improve all those dimensions, it may take decades without any result. But uh, we see some countries, they were able to take off. And uh, on the condition, they have a very poor infrastructure, poor institution, poor governance. So I think that is one area. Certainly, I don't have an answer. How to help a poor you know, country with those kind of bad condition to take off. But fundamentally, if we cannot do that, then it's very hard for us to really help the country to improve. OK, point taken. Hi, Han from UNU. Uh, I'd like to point out a possibility for future research, and uh, that is uh, the, um, uh, the, the ASEAN integration in uh, 2015. Um, I think um, uh, there is a, a lot of goodwill for this uh, regional integration, but there, re there really isn't enough uh, evidence from research uh, to inform the policy makers in this regard. ASEAN was formed in 67. I think Vietnam uh, joined in 1995. Uh, the newest member is Myanmar. Uh, they've talked about the um, ASEAN economic region uh, for 2020 and they brought it forward to 2015, which is next year. There's a lot of uh, goodwill. 
there's a lot of papers signed, and if you talk to the, the younger ministers, they say, um, but in those papers are a lot of exceptions, and we really need uh, more evidence on how to make this work. So maybe one possibility is thinking about do the Nordic countries who are more integrated uh, have lessons for um, the ASEAN countries? Uh, are there lessons that, the, that ASEAN can learn from the Nordic countries? So um, that's, the, that's my research bait. Hopefully somebody will take it up. Thank you. Okay, Professor Honkapoya, what's your reaction? Are the Nordics integrated? <laughs> uh, yeah, the Nordics, uh, I mean, there is no, there is uh, something called the Nordic Council, and there are some formal structures. There's, I, would, I would say it's more cooperation than integration. I mean, early on, early on, of course, the common labor market was introduced already in the 1950s and so forth. But, uh, but uh, otherwise, otherwise uh, there, is, there is not that much formal. And of course, with the exception of Norway, you know, Denmark, Finland, and Sweden are part of the European Union, which then dictates a lot of the, lot of the uh, overall policy framework, framework and, and environment in this. But, but one important thing is to, is, to, is to meet often, the politicians meet regularly, talk to each other, the research meet regularly. And this has been going on for, for decades. I mean, the Nordic welfare model, it's difficult to date it exactly, but one, would, one could probably date them before World War II, in the 1920s and 30s, certainly Sweden had that, uh, uh, had that model, the beginnings of the model already then. And then it was a systematic development, also learning from each other's experiences, experiences there. And, uh, and, and luckily, you know, what Justin was saying about the good governance and good institutions, the, the, you know, the, that, that was pretty much in place in, in, in the Nordic countries. They were democracies early on. Uh, women voting rights, for example, came very early on, so forth. So, so many of these good governance elements were there. And then it's a matter of learning, and it's also a matter of adapting to new, new, new circumstances. One thing which I didn't talk since I was asked to talk about the financial aspect was that the 90s crisis also was an overall economic crisis. It also meant that you had to reform the Nordic welfare model, you know, adjusted it in important ways. And, and, and there has to be, uh, you know, these are small countries, open countries, where, which prosper on the basis of foreign trade international activities, participating in that, being competitive there, is the precondition for the success. And then, then, in some sense, one way to think about the welfare model is to say that that provides the insurance. You know, you know we know that competition has always losers as well, and the social welfare model is the insurance that uh, the, all, all of the people in the society will be treated in a reasonably good manner. So that's, that, I think, is important. It's, it's not necessarily formal con contracts and so forth, but the willingness to adapt, willingness to change, willingness to look at each other, try to find the good practices, but not follow them just automatically, adapt them to the specific circumstances of each of the countries. Thank you very much, Seppo. I think there was a hand up here. Yeah, okay, we'll take the first row and then go to the second row. The, the most interesting uh, idea that uh, I got from the conference is this concept of latent comparative advantage. It taught me that even though right now, say, we are exporting, we have a comparative advantage in raw materials like coffee, tea, we do not have to do that throughout. We, we have better options there uh, which we can explore and be able to export high value uh, products. So I found that quite uh, encouraging. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Moabu. Then just behind you. My name is Joseph Tufo from Ghana. Um, one of the things I'm um, taking home is about the uh, issues that were presented yesterday morning, particularly in the context of uh, the use of uh, uh, database policy and not data waived policy. I think it was raised yesterday morning, which I think is, is key in the context of developing countries uh, the proposing or developing policies. It shouldn't be based on arbitrary issues, but data on historical issues as we've, we've uh, somebody raised out there that we should learn from history. And I think that is one of the key things that uh, would help in proposing uh, 
policy, public policy for um, developing countries. The other aspect that I think um, borders on all the research uh, output that we've been talking about and doing our various uh, institutes and universities is about the integration issues. Uh, in terms of uh, often times we find the researchers or the academics doing their research and then the output is not integrated well into public policy once uh, we have the politicians or the uh, technocrats on one side and then the uh, researchers doing their own things. They have fine results from data they, con they collect and analyze, and, but the integration is what I see as a, a problem that I think we should be begin to think about how to integrate uh, the results into public policy or bringing the two sides uh, uh, together. Thank okay, you. thank you. Haroon, can I put you on the spot and ask, I mean, I'm sometimes joking when I say the high level panel report, does it call for a revolution? And then sort of people scratch their head a little bit and then they think, is there a revolution call in there? And there's actually at least one revolution call. There's a call for a data revolution. Could you say a couple of words about, I mean, sort of what, what went into that? What, what were the discussions around that topic? Uh, I don't, I don't want to thank you for putting me on the spot because I'm thinking about my flight and getting out of here. But uh, <laughs> So okay. the data revolution idea was, was a big one, but I think Perhaps just to, and, and, and maybe I can put Ernest and uh, Ravi on the spot, is that it has probably the strongest resonance for me uh, on the African continent. Um, so Ravi mentioned our minimum wage study. And so just by way of an example, and we, with Li Shi, who I think is somewhere in the audience, yeah, are planning thanks. a global workshop on minimum wages and its impact. And we've got, I don't know, half a dozen, uh, a dozen countries from different regions, not just continents, but we only have one country for Africa, and that's South Africa. So we can't find a single minimum wage study uh, for any other African country besides South Africa. I think there's an old one by Michael Walton for Zimbabwe. And w one of the key reasons is that it's very difficult to get decent labor force survey data, income and expenditure survey data, census data for, for the continent. And I think that started the discussion in the high-level panel report, that the continent where you arguably find the disproportionate share of the poverty and inequality challenges is the continent with the poorest uh, 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 availability of, of data. I asked Koshik at dinner about this, and he said, yes, it's on the agenda, but the resource line is fairly thin. Uh, and I think that's, that's part of the problem. I think there's a, there's a bigger issue which we didn't deal with in the high-level panel report around capacity building and statistical offices um, and so on. Which, so it's not just the provision of data, but actually how you go about doing that. <coughs> okay, thank you very much, Arun. I, I'm gonna come back here. Uh, I saw Gary, you had a hand up. I can't just resist going to you now because. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, I had uh, two takeaways, one of which was a, an affirmation and one of which was a surprise. The affirmation was, I've come to believe that about 80%, 90% of the issues that arise across the different countries, across the different continents, are the same issues. And, and it's the remaining 10 or 20% that require local specificity. Um, there are a few outliers. South Africa really is a, an outlier in that respect. And, uh, and uh, I've learned a lot from going and working there. So that's, that's one thing. The part that comes as a surprise to me was that in the jobs session we had yesterday, uh, I let off my talk by saying, uh, I define economic development to be an improvement in people's material standards of living, and then I started talking about how labor market incomes could uh, uh, be a focal point for that. The part that surprised me was the number of people who came up to me afterwards and said, thank you for defining what economic development is, <laughs> because I agree with that definition, and I haven't heard it. So I just wanted to say, uh, thank you to all of you for <laughs> confirming that. Okay, thank you very much, Gary. Uh, Li Shi, uh, I can't, I mean, there's a little bit of a light up here, so sometimes it's a difficulty. Uh, you wanted to add something? Um, oh, that's not Li Shi, but anyway. Where are you? Thank you so uh, much. Uh, no, no, I, I, no I've, I've noted that. Uh, in go one ahead, of please. The, in a, one of the parallel sessions in the morning today, uh, Francis Lund was talking about how RCTs are conducted in Mexico uh, with regard to the PROGRESSA study was used uh, as an evidence to convince the policymakers in South Africa to implement certain features of the scheme related to the child grant scheme. Now, it is uh, 
this conference has really brought about the lessons and what are the problems in implementing, in designing and implementing development policies. Especially, it is very, as a PhD researcher, it is uh, heartening to, and very motivating to know that such evidence is being used by the policymakers. And despite the negative comments on the field of economics and economics and, uh, and such. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now move back here. I will come over this side as well again, but up here in the second row, there was a, somebody who wanted to join in. Thank you. I actually learned a lot from all the sessions uh, the last two days. I'd just like to flag uh, one point which was actually started off by Kaushik in relation to when you discussed corruption. Um, and as, especially the, the work of um, Harun and, and Ravi on uh, institutionalized corruption and subsequently what was followed by Sam's addition to political corruption. Uh, my feeling is the social norm argument makes uh, tremendous, looks very powerful because the, the risk of getting caught is zero from, from what the evidence we got from South Africa. With that in mind, I think uh, uh, the afternoon we had Lance's presentation which I thought was really excellent in, in how possibly we can go about addressing these kinds of corruption which I think are far more um, um, important than, than, say, someone break, breaking traffic rules. So I think there you, you had an example where he, he articulated by mentioning participants in those organizations. If you have all these good guys uh, demonstrating some sort of good behavior, then maybe that will have an impact. The thought, say, Harun and Ravi came out on South Africa. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I'd like just for one minute just to ask whether anybody from the panel wants to kick in at this point. No, sure, no, I'll carry on, Reg. It's just if, if one of you were sort of sitting there burning to jump in now, then, okay. Uh, Roger? My take home is that the conference doesn't stop when you go home because there'll be all sorts of interesting things on the website. Well, you and, take that home. Uh, <laughs> and uh, indeed. And um, the thing I was um, most surprised by uh, was uh, the work by Hindin and others on uh, light manufacturing. And I want to know uh, from uh, the panel members, is the news about light, manufact light manufacturing really as good as Hindin and his colleagues uh, argue, particularly with respect to Africa? Because I think it's a very, very uh, interesting piece of work. And I read it on the plane. I couldn't even get to sleep because I was uh, so excited by something from the World Bank. <laughs> OK. Is Hing in the audience? No. Nope. OK. I will get over there. So uh, I think, Channing, you were there. I am moving this way. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to mention something that uh, I didn't know, even though I, I work in, in the area. And I think uh, uh, Doug Arendt from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory pointed out that uh, this year we're passing an important Rubicon in that uh, the new generation capacity of electricity, more renewable power uh, is installed this year than fossil fuels plus nuclear. So there's, there's more gigawatts of, of renewables, principally solar and wind, going installed now than, than gas, coal, and nuclear. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, my take home uh, message here is that uh, it is very important that developing countries build very strong institutions. And uh, this is important because if we have strong institutions, then we will be able to institutionalize decision or policy making processes. But the big question here is, how do we get to build institutions in developing countries when people who benefit, uh, when, when weak institutions are benefiting people who are supposed to change or build these institutions? Uh, for example, you have a situation where uh, gold mining in most African countries uh, attracts only 3% royal ad value royalty to uh, most of the countries where the gold is located. So how do you tend to build institutions in a country where there is corruption and people benefit from weak institutions? Okay. Thank you, Wisdom. I think Hai was here. Thank you, Finn. And um, I'm Hai from CIM Vietnam. And um, actually, I, I just had uh, the opportunity today to participate in the workshop, but uh, actually I already took home uh, a number of lessons, uh, especially 
uh, at least for example, I participate in two sections, like the institutional reform for green financing, for example. So I uh, also understand that this is uh, still uh, st uh, challenging when we apply green financing, even though in Vietnam we have already the green growth strategy. Uh, and uh, also the um, other the, league, the, the institutional reform and, and especially the implementation is uh, also more difficult than the policy itself. And I also agree with uh, Christina as well as also the Ravi on, on uh, the, the, the sense that we is not always we just uh, mimic or uh, uh, other countries or uh, but I, I would like to uh, and you also emphasize the local condition and also local institution uh, the difference in the local institution uh, but uh, what I, I, I have a, di a little bit uh, different idea is that uh, uh, we are here. Maybe we, we we should share. We should learn. I would like to focus more on the lesson learned from the similarities rather than the differences. And uh, so, in that sense, uh, I think even with the local tradition we we emphasize somehow. But I, I would like to f emphasize a little bit more on the a common lesson, the common lesson that uh, we can learn from each other, or even Vietnam, we also uh, uh, eager to, to learn the, the lesson from others. And I think this is uh, uh, very important, and, and uh, that's why we share uh, the experiences. Uh, I just want to say that uh, actually, we, I, uh, from myself, from my uh, understanding, I, I have learned a lot, because they, under the certain uh, uh, similarity uh, condition, so we we might apply uh, somehow uh, even the experiences from Nordic countries as well as from other developing countries are very useful. Uh, and the, the just the second uh, thing, uh, I I wonder just a little bit about the trade-off between the evidence-based uh, research and the actual policy uh, making process. I I fully agree with Kisrina in the sense that uh, we need to have the uh, evidence-based uh, research supporting for the policy-making process. But uh, I still uh, wonder the trade-off between these two, because sometimes they, the policy-making process, they need to have a very quick decision uh, to make, uh, and, and how we can integrate well uh, between the, the research that takes some time to complete to the policy-making process. And uh, uh, and uh, just the last point, uh, I think uh, there's, of course we are have a, we have number of uh, of uh, research, uh, the further research that's uh, continue. But from my view, might be uh, one of the issues that the the condition for the institutional reforms uh, and uh, the effects of the institutional reform on um, the others, the social issue like employment and labor market as well as the other, uh, other issue of the country. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, hi. I mean, you said that there's often a long time between the evidence and then sort of the policies being made and so on. And I was kind of pondering because, uh, I mean, as I mentioned in my introduction, I, I, the first time I came here was about 15 years ago. And it's only about the last year that I've sort of started realizing that, yes, the policy makers actually do listen. They don't necessarily tell you. So Santiago, when do we actually know that the policymakers actually do listen? Um. I'm going to get to you, Ravi, afterwards. It's kind of an, an, iterative pro, an iterative process. I mean, one is continuously interacting with them. You know when they listen, when, when exposed, they turn out to do what you told them to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's kind of a, a subjective judgment. I mean, yeah, okay. but, you know, these finance ministers and presidents, at least in my experience in Latin America, they're continuously talking to people in the multilateral institutions, they're continuously talking among themselves, they're continuously talking to people in their own academia and their own think tanks. They're, they're listening all the time. Yeah. What is the process by which they s selectively select this piece of evidence and they dismiss that other piece of evidence is very subjective. So it's kind of a bit of randomness yeah. in there. Um, the, the collegiality <coughs> does help, however, to sort of sort out the really, really bad ideas. 
and maybe helps to highlight the really, really good ideas, and then it leaves kind of a gray area in the middle. But this is a learning process that is continuous and iterative, which open interesting possibilities for researchers because continuously, you know, you can put out your ideas and your findings, and you, you get a hearing. Yeah. Okay. Ravi, you. Just a, a couple of, uh, so I, I sort of agree. With, uh, so I think what's probably important is is to create that ecology uh, where the research is done, and there's a mindset to translate that into. Uh, uh, the actual impact, I think, as I said, is pretty random and so on. And if it's a, if it's a mistake, the policymaker will, uh, will blame you. But if it's a success, they'll probably take credit for themselves and so on. But that's a, that's a, I'll just give you a little anecdote on this. Uh, we actually had a, uh, Jan Svena and I organized a meeting in, in uh, Colombia uh, in relation to the next WDR on, on behavioral and so on. And some of my Cornell colleagues were there who were actually world leaders in, in behavioral research. Uh, David Just was there in particular. And they'd done stuff on, on sort of uh, uh, obesity and uh, you know, these large, large containers in which drinks are sold and so on and so forth. So on the basis of that, uh, Mayor Bloomberg of New York uh, 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 introduced a new regulation about the size of these things. And he very generously quoted their research saying, see, Cornell research has done it. But they'd also done research on how you don't put out these sorts of policies. <laughs> and he, of course, followed exactly that <laughs> the route. <laughs> And, was, and basically, it's now been killed. It was basically killed. So in the press conference, when he was saying, look, these guys have done this research. It's fantastic. They're, this is why I did it. And the, then the press guy said, but look, they've also shown this research. This is not how you do this. He said, oh, those guys from Cornell, they're idiots. <laughs> <laughs> so it depends. This relationship between policymakers and researchers is a very, very tricky uh, one. Can I make one, yeah, uh, one sure. more? No, sure. Ravi, please. So it goes back to uh, 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 Sam's point that uh, some types of policy uh, Sam Wangwei's point, sometimes the policy don't need money, they, need, uh, they just need to be done. But actually, they, they may not need financial capital, but they always need political capital uh, because there'll be winners and there'll be losers from any particular change that one, that one does. And in fact, to, to address that, one may need financial capital, in effect, to compensate uh, the losers. One can do it directly or indirectly. And so, on. so let me give you an example where, where I think researchers have been doing work but somehow it's, it, it's not having an impact on policy. And that's on, on, foods, on food and fuel subsidies. Uh, very important in North Africa, very important in many other countries as well. So there's a particular dance that we've gotten into. Right? We, do, we have use our household surveys, we do incidence analysis, and we show that this or that subsidy is very poorly targeted. And then we go to the policymakers, and there's a huge fiscal, of course there's a huge fiscal exposure. So we say, well, if you remove this, there will not be that big an impact on poverty. You all know that, okay? Every single report that comes out of the bank or the fund is of that type for the last 20 years. You could, you could write the executive summary without even looking at the, at the detail of the stuff, okay? And the policymaker says, are you crazy? If I do this thing, there are gonna be people out in the streets and I'm, I'm, gonna, be, you know, I'm gonna be out. There's, there's no way that I can do this. And then the next study again says you po poverty incidents, et cetera, et cetera. So how could we, how could we push that forward? How could we, and well, here, here, one way in which using our, our, our very, this very same methods that we currently use, which is to try out packages of, uh, of, of interventions, which is uh, removing this subsidy plus this type of, and, and those have to be actual instruments, not some generalized, uh, idealized transfer which will in fact compensate exactly the one, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's an incidence analysis with two, two variations. One is, packages of implementable instruments, not the single food subsidy removal combined with some idealized transfer which will take care of this. So that's one thing. And secondly, looking at the incidents not just on the poor, but on politically salient, socio-politically salient groups. Okay? Those two combinations, which I, and I put it to you that we don't have that type of analysis, and we could do that sort of analysis relatively easily, with the, with the, but that will require an interaction between the researcher and the policymaker <laughs> where the researcher finds out what are the implementable combinations of policy instruments, and secondly, what are the politically, socio-politically salient groups in that particular local situation. Because without, without that combination, because really what's going on in the policymaker's mind, it's certainly the politician's mind, is he's doing those calculations at the back of his mind. So I think perhaps that's one area where We've gotten into a very stale dance, I think, where we just produce the same old incidence analysis. The policymaker says, are you crazy? I can't do this. And then we go back 10 years later, we do the same analysis. So perhaps a slight move in that direction might help. At least that's what I've been, that's what I've been pushing for. I, I, I mean, I, I just can't, cannot not say that there's actually a book coming out 
OUP later on this year, um, edited by Pippin Stobanderson, where we have actually asked why did policymakers act the way they did in the food and, and uh, price crisis. So, I mean, it doesn't go all the way that you're asking, Ravi, but it at least goes part of the way in trying to figure out what were the rationales for what they were doing in that very important crisis that took place around 2008 uh, in terms of the food prices. So, at least sort of some of that. So, let that be a small advertisement. Christina, you... Yeah, yeah, just maybe very briefly, there has been very eloquent responses to the relationship between evidence and, and policy making. Um, maybe just maybe from the side of the, of the donor organizations, it's very much true that policy making is very much about timing. And we wouldn't have time to sit down for a few years and wait for the researchers to come up with, uh, with, with, with answers and proposals. I think that there are two ways to look at it. First, I think that the donors have to invest in a, sort of into a constant evidence gathering. It means interacting with, with, uh, with uh, researchers, uh, being involved in different processes so that as, a, as an organization, as an institution, you collect a body of evidence which is basis for the certain basic choices that you make in, in, in your policies. Then I think that the second one, which is extremely important, is actually we, we have had comments on the implementation and the challenges of implementation. I think that uh, we have to invest in, in monitoring and evaluate, evaluating what we actually do and what we actually achieve. And this goes back to the accountability challenge that I think is very topical to the national, um, national institutions as well as to the donor institutions. And I think that this is a, a key for us to become learning organizations, to allow independent evaluators, sectoral experts to come and actually evaluate what we are achieving and take lessons from there. So I think you have this long term gathering the body of evidence and then you have the investments in the implementation, monitoring and evaluation and ensuring that your system actually learns from that. Okay, thanks Christina. Okay, we go to South Africa. Francie, and thank you for not pro protesting wildly early on when we called you Francis. I, <coughs> thanks. Uh, Francie, here in the front. Here in the front. I was, thank you very much for that. I was part in 1993 of the very helpful World Bank um, survey on poverty reduction and living standards, one of those things. And um, when we were analyzing the results, um, and this is after just going through the miracle of the peace, relatively peaceful transition in South Africa, the chief, one of the chief people in the World Bank, they're sitting around the table, we were looking at all the findings, and he said, Wow, history matters. And I, 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 it was really difficult. And I want to say here that a take home, a, a, there's been so much learning, just so very much learning, and thank you very much. But I think that if UNU WIDA is to say that it is more multidisciplinary, as a non economic social scientist, it's very hard to hear people say, it, which was said two or three times, society matters and norms matter. If you're brought up as a non-economic social scientist, that's, that's where you start, the embeddedness of social relationships and then how the market and the polity affects that. So it, it's just, it's actually, it's um, just wanted to put that on the table. Totally opportunistic in terms of that's not the take home message. Those will take some more time to process. Thank you, Finn. Okay, thank you. Some of us are slow, but we eventually get there. <laughs> Up here in the front. So, no, no, come on, I was joking. Up here in the front. I want to say a word not about the product, but the process of this conference. Uh, development economics and economic development are very big topics, very complex. And I think that as we have become mainstreamed as a profession. We also have been subjected to the rigors of publication. It takes a lot of time to develop a good paper. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, we tend to be locked into kind of narrow, small issues. 
And this coexistence that we certainly find in conferences like this one is very important. It forces us to sort of elevate the game, to go into the big issues, as we talked about in the, for the book the, the, the other day. So I like to kind of say that the wider ULU has a very important role here, which is to serve as a place where the community can meet, can join from an, with an interdisciplinary perspective, to face to policymakers and the users of the products of research, which in turn allows us to get a feedback onto our own research agenda, redefine what our, our priorities are going to be, and all come back enriched of the experience. So I want to thank uh, Wider for the experience. Thank you very much. Think development, think wider. Thank you. Um, I got something very interesting, uh, a quote uh, from um, Lan this afternoon that says, in order to have effective policy communication, then you need to whisper in the ear of the powerful. So I'm looking for a volunteer to help to whisper to the Bretton Woods institutions that there's nothing like a rational man who can use the price signals to promote inclusion and sustainability outside the institutional context. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. There was some other hand over there. I just cannot remember where it was. Okay, I was probably wrong. Nobody here? Okay, Sam. Uh, this is stimulated by what I have heard uh, from colleagues. Uh, I think the what we have learned is that we researchers also have a lot to learn. Uh, we should not always think that we are right. Those who are not uh, listening to us, there's something wrong with them. We have to push harder and harder and harder. I think we should sit back and say maybe we have to reflect harder on the quality of what we have done. In particular, whether we have taken into account other aspects in society, where they have understood who the losers and the gainers are in society and taken that into account as we uh, make policy recommendations. And two, related to that, that would expose some of the situations where some policymakers resist in their own interest. And they say, no, no, it's because uh, these uh, people will lose. When our studies expose that actually the losers are some of them, our experience is actually it silence. It silences or softens their resistance. Once it's clear that actually it's not these people, it's a section of these resistors. So I think uh, being more careful in our own research, understanding the implications of why certain groups of policymakers may resist and preempting that. I think it's a, an important way of ensuring that our results can actually be, be taken. <clears throat> okay, Th thank you, Sam, for stressing that learning is a two-way street. It's not a one-way street. Listening is involved. Okay, Mwabu? Thank you very much. I think what is missing is a clearing house for uh, research papers that can be implemented with the aim of improving people's lives. Because it's very difficult to write a good paper um, that has a practical application. And many of the papers, if they, if they, if they are implemented, can have only disastrous consequences. So I believe that uh, there should be some more mechanism, a clearing house for uh, choosing implementable paper. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Hong, you had some? Uh, thank you, Finn. Um, I'm Hong from CIM. Um, to reflect to the uh, today's uh, conference, uh, I uh, would like uh, first uh, to thank for uh, giving us as a CIM a chance to uh, to have uh, the conference uh, in collaboration with UN to wider to the, uh, uh, 
over the last two days. Uh, second, uh, during the last two days, uh, from my personal uh, impression, uh, I found that the, all the topics we discussed during the last two days were very, very interesting. And uh, perhaps uh, it were very uh, useful for the researchers uh, like uh, us as uh, the policy um, uh, think tanks uh, um, researchers. Um, and uh, we, we think that uh, to influence to our uh, kind of the government policy make, uh, makers, um, we need to have uh, some time to digest uh, what we learned from the last two days. And we think that uh, what we learn doesn't mean that this very uh, is immediately can be applied in uh, Vietnamese context uh, because uh, there are other factors which can influence uh, to the policy making process for uh, for example include, uh, including the political context and also kind of the interests of the policy makers uh, so anyway uh, I, I found the last two days uh, conference uh, were, very, uh, were very, very interesting, and I, 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 I believe that other Vietnamese participants also have the same feeling. And I hope that uh, in the future uh, we uh, would have uh, more chances to to uh, to, to have uh, such kind of conference to be organized in Vietnam, so that uh, more Vietnamese people can uh, be able uh, to learn from other countries' uh, experience on not only the institutional reforms or, uh, or the issue of the economic uh, development, uh, but uh, also uh, other aspects as well. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. One hand over here. Okay, we go there. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. And uh, uh, one thing that I would like to highlight, which I think se it seems to be disappear in the discussion, especially when Kaushik was talking of social norms, is to what extent then social norms can be driven by ICT. And I can give a very concrete example here. For example, if we think of Arab Springs, how it actually moved across uh, the northern Africa, Egypt, uh, uh, Tunisia, Algeria. It was quite very fast and very dramatic, and partly it was because of the ICT. So while we are trying to conjecture how we can sort of include uh, social norms into the development agenda, we are, I think it will be also important to take into account that uh, social norm change dramatically, especially in the globalized, in the digitalized world now. And, and so in that way, there could be a, a great area where uh, we could see a lot of transformation, not necessarily reflecting what the society is going uh, through, but it could be the reflection of what is going through in other countries. What is the role of media in this case? So I, I think that, 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 that is a very, for me personal, that was a very uh, intellectually stimulating idea while I tend to agree that social norms could indeed be important for shaping policies, but I wouldn't take it as a rule of thumb. I would be more careful in terms of what other dimensions in the society that could also impinge on these social norms that we are looking into. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. I will now take a very quick round. I'll start over here and then move very quickly that way. Um, I saw Celestin, Tony. Anybody else over there? Okay, Celestin first, then Tony. Uh, thank you. I'm Celestin Monga from the World Bank. I uh, really thank, uh, thank you to WIDER for this uh, wonderful conference and the two days of discussions. I've learned uh, a lot and taken a lot of notes. Uh, so let me perhaps just speak quickly on something which I believe uh, may be still missing. Uh, listening for two days to the conversations, I sometimes had the feeling that we researchers are the good guys and we are discussing institutions and very often referring to policy makers and politicians as the bad guys, the people who are not doing what they are supposed to do. Uh, I don't know to what extent that's true uh, because I tend to believe that most political leaders, most policy makers want to do the right thing. Of course, there are some crazy outliers out there, okay? Uh, uh, but I would say that 
8% of them really want to do the right thing. Now, um, I think that we researchers are failing to find the right way, the right incentives to make sure that they get the right ideas. I've heard a couple of times things like, well, you may have good plans, good policies, and then bad implementation. I tend to believe that that's not feasible. Uh, a good plan, a good policy should include the possibility of implementation. If you have a good idea which is not implemented, I think it's not a good idea because it's the piece which is missing. And I think that's the mistake that we tend to make. So to sum up, uh, I think that our research should be more geared towards things which are feasible, implementable, taking more concretely the perspective of the politician, their utility functions, their constraints, uh, the political calendar that they face, the constraint that they face. And if we do that, then we'll be thinking more about quick wins, things that give them possibilities to do even more. Otherwise, we will keep you know, sitting in our laboratories running regressions and finding you know, positive coefficients and say these are the right things to do and have conferences where we complain that politicians are the bad guys and they're not listening to us. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. We need to work with politicians, of course. And they are not stupid, such as the peasants out here on the way to the airport. They are not stupid either. They try to figure out how to survive, how to live. Absolutely taken. Tony? Um, Tony Edison from uh, UNU Wider. Um, we've, we've come a long way since the creation of the um, Millennium Development Goals um, 14 years ago. And in some ways, the, one of the issues um, we face now is, is what comes in the next 15 or so years. And one thing that I take away from this conference is the importance of uh, jobs and job creation. I think that uh, very much needs to uh, go forward as an issue. And when I'm asked what I learned in Vietnam, and this is only my, only my second visit to Vietnam, and um, I've only been to Hanoi, but nevertheless I'm an economist, so I will immediately extrapolate from my uh, vast uh, uh, wisdom, is, is, is the importance of job creation and the success of Vietnam, uh, not only in creating uh, jobs uh, in the uh, manufacturing sector, but also uh, improving uh, rural employment and increasingly uh, improving employment in the disadvantaged and the more remote regions of the country through infrastructure investment. That's another side of Vietnam which is very much connected to job creation. And I think that story of successful development in the world needs to go forward uh, and to be taken up more broadly over the next uh, two decades. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Anybody here? Here? One here, yeah. Witness. Okay, thank you. My name is Witness Simonega from uh, ARC. So, yeah, so I think these uh, two days have been very stimulating and very interesting. And uh, so I just want to sort of uh, add my voice to the discussion around the political economy of policy making. So, um, so I think one of the, there are a couple of things that one would have to take into account. So obviously, if you look at how many sort of research outputs one gets and the kind of recommendations and contradictions or sort of uh, contrasting positions that some research on related topics would uh, sort of give the kind of recommendations, I think you can begin to understand why, of course, uh, we should not really expect that all the recommendations that we make as researchers should find their way into policy. And... Um, I do agree with, uh, with what Mwabu was uh, talking about in terms of some sort of clearing. The, the way I would see it is that actually, if in our government departments they are su sufficiently capacitated uh, with people who can actually look at the research out there, who understand what those, those sort of civil servants, they do understand the political constraints that they are, the, the, the policymakers face, and then they can then play around with the research and try to figure out what is implementable. Because I think it will be very difficult for, I, I mean, I'm just trying to think through how feasible is it that we can always researchers have it some time with policymakers to really understand the, the constraints they face and things like that. So I think it would be a challenge. So obviously if you have some platform where within the policymaking space there are people who can actually uh, understand the research and then uh, uh, configure it or put it in such a way that the policymaker understands and then they take into account the constraints that are, are encountered by policymakers. I, th I think that would be a way forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Omar. Uh, thanks very much. I very much, as a non-economist, enjoyed uh, the presentations that uh, most of them have not, in fact, included lots of numbers, but lots of ideas, so I've been able to follow them. One of the explicit central themes of the conference has been about change, and not just any kind of change, but change in a particular direction, at least we hope, positive change, uh, reform, and serious reform, institutional reform and structural transformation. So what's at stake is considerable. And what struck me from many of the presentations is that the process of change is an explicitly and intrinsically political one. And one of the areas perhaps for future research, and this is, I guess, I suppose a plug for political scientists such as myself, is to in fact involve more political scientists in understanding these processes of change. Um, the incentives and the disincentives, the prevailing norms and the countervailing norms, and the types of relationships that we might be interested to look at here are not just those between policymakers and researchers, but also within policymakers themselves, between regimes and civil society, between governments and donors, for example. So uh, please invite me again. I'd like to come along. Political scientists uh, have a lot to say here as well. Thank you. Absolutely, Uma. You have a lot to say. <laughs> Anybody else in the audience? Okay. I now turn to the panel. You don't have to say anything, but I'll start with Ravi, and then we we'll just move for those of you who may have one or two words. Ravi? Yeah, so two, uh, two things on which I'm still not sure. Um, one is uh, for policy reform, uh, whether one should go big bang or whether one should go gradually. Uh, it, it's not uh, obviously on a case-by-case -case basis we can discuss it, but I don't know what the principles are. <laughs> which would determine whether one should go this way or that way, and so on. Okay. Financial deregulation, uh, as, uh, as Seppo said, we should take it gradually, and so on. But I often hear the statement, you know, strike while the iron is hot. Okay, this is the window. If you don't do it now, you will, etc. How do we weigh up those two things? I mean, as researchers, how do we think about those things? I'm afraid I don't, I don't, have, a, I don't have a really uh, you know, a good way of handling that, and I don't, yeah. The second thing that I don't really have, I'm afraid, is, is the social norms. <laughs> so uh, every, we, we talk about it, we mention it, and I suppose we can, we can recognize it when we see it. But as an analytical construct that will help us through the, the, the design of this versus that, again, on a case-by-case -case basis, we can do all sorts of things, take constraints into account and so on. I myself find it to be quite a slippery, uh, slippery thing, uh, and a bit, like, a bit like informality when you say social norms. The mind picture comes in the mind of the person, whatever mind picture it is, it's a different one for different people. And as analysts, I think we have to be very careful of that. So that's my second sort of thing. And finally, I'll say in response to Celestin that uh, one of the things that I say to my students is actually taking into account these political economy constraints will actually lead to uh, really neat research that you can get published in high quality journals. Churning out yet another <laughs> standard model will get you published in a standard journal. But really taking these into, the constraints into account could actually give you a neat, really neat model which would get you published in a top class journal. So that's the response that I give to my students. OK, Rami, thanks. Plandina, yeah. Uh, Plandina, I, I read you. Yeah, OK, fine. Santiago? I guess this is just a, a point that I try to make for people who do research. And I don't think of myself as a researcher, but for the people who actually do research, there's been a huge growth in literature on evaluating individual programs. And we've learned a lot about individual programs. But I think now we need to take a, a, a quantum leap and begin to think about methodologies that allow to evaluate how very many programs interact with each other. And, and to evaluate sort of strategies as opposed to individual programs because they, they might be working in different directions and when you put everything together, it, it doesn't gel. It doesn't gel well. So that I think is sort of in its infancy because of the sort of things that Alain was saying, that the journals like a very small question, very well done, very well polished, with a very unambiguous answer, the tendency is for research to go that way. But from the policy perspective, the question is, how does this fit in the context of everything else? And you want to have a sense of the various pol programs in interacting with each other, and the answer to the individual pieces is useful, but it's not enough. A and moving in that direction, I think, is, is kind of a challenge. Thank you very much, Santiago. Anybody else uh, moving? Christine, okay. Ernest, you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the, the, the question that Celestine uh, posed has forced me to more or less reflect on the many of the things that happen around me as an African researcher. 
And indeed, he's right that uh, we, we don't pay enough attention to the politicians' uh, needs or objective function. Uh, but I think there's also the, 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 the uh, reverse, in the sense that there's a, a certain established distrust between researchers and politicians. And uh, the distrust is even more pronounced uh, between African researchers and African governments. Uh, and we've got to find a way of dealing with it. Um, I come from a country where we've been actively engaged in economic reforms for more than two decades. And I find it very sad and painful that uh, many of the errors in management that we sought to correct uh, 25 years ago mm -hmm. are being repeated today, where there's a lot more knowledge and a lot more information about uh, economic policy than there was 25 years ago. And yet, when I listen to the finance minister, he uses the kind of language that suggests he knows everything that I know. So he's learned the language that pleases donors. And so he's able to do things that 25 years ago, no finance minister would have gotten away with. And yet nobody talks because the environment is different. Basically, the incentive for good behavior as a policymaker has changed. A lot of has changed in the last 25 years in the region. How do we create an environment in which policymakers feel a need to listen to researchers? How do we create an environment in which researchers feel obliged to do relevant work, relevant work that cannot be dismissed? It's easy for an African government official to dismiss the work of local researchers. They will take on board a bit grudgingly the research work of outsiders because most of it is tied to donor funds. So if somebody tied to USAID as a consultant does work, it's much more likely that the Minister of Finance and Mechanics will read it and uh, would probably call some discussion of it, not even if the same work is being done by locals. So there are things that we can do in our countries. There are things that we can do to inspire confidence on both sides, and there are things that we can do to remove the distrust. So long as it remains there, nobody is going to take the research seriously enough and nobody's also going to uh, pursue uh, policy making in a very serious manner, even if the evidence is there. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. We've come almost to the end of our conference. Um, you and you wider has for almost 30 years uh, been hosted by the government of Finland. So I'm pleased to be able to introduce to you His Excellency Kim Uleta Vieta, Ambassador of Finland to Vietnam. He's kindly agreed to contribute a few words uh, before I will have just a few concluding remarks. Ambassador, please. Distinguished Dr. David Malone, uh, Under Secretary General of the United Nations and Rector of the United Nations University. Professor Ernst Ariete, Vice Chancellor of the University of Ghana and Chair of wider board. Professor Nguyen Dinh Kung, President of the Central Institute of Economic Management of Vietnam. Sure. Professor Finn Tarp, Director of World Institute of, for Development Economics Research of the United Nations University, ladies and gentlemen. I believe this conference has truly shown the value of international collaboration. We have listened <coughs> to so many different country experiences from Asia to Africa to Latin America and also to experiences from my own region, the Nordic countries of Denmark and Finland, for example. These experiences show that there is not one model of successful development. Success has many fathers and mothers. Countries can achieve economic transformation, inclusive development, and environmentally sustainable societies using a wide variety of institutions and policies. The international community is helping, including through foreign aid, 
But success is led by the countries themselves, their people and their governments. This fact is also at the heart of Finnish development cooperation. Hanoi has been a very appropriate setting for this conference. Vietnam has achieved strong growth during the last decades. It has diversified its the economy, creating a strong manufacturing base, and it has invested in agriculture and its productivity. It has reached, it has achieved one of the largest and fastest reductions of poverty in history. Yet, as new challenges are emerging, structural reforms are urgently need needed. Like Vietnam has done already, also many other countries are now moving along the route from no low to middle income status. The progress of Africa is especially welcome. It has been very good to see so many African colleagues at this conference, to learn from their insights and experiences. Yet our work is never done. The threat of climate change could undermine development progress. In the Nordic region, we have a special concern for environmental sustainability. Therefore, it's been good to see so much discussion of the climate change and environment challenges at this conference, in clean energy, for example, and how we can integrate sustainability to support transformation and inclusion. Inclusion, which is not just about reducing absolute poverty, but reducing inequality, has been a constant theme over the two days. And we cannot achieve true inclusion until we also achieve gender equality. Uno Wider has for many years exercised leadership on the issue of inequality and development, well before it became fashionable. This is one reason why Uno Wider is in the top 10 of international developed think tanks for four years running. This conference demonstrates again Uno Wider's strength in bringing together researchers and policymakers from across the world to share experiences of what works and what can be done better. As Finn mentioned, Finland has been proud to host Uno Wider in its Helsinki home for nearly 30 years, with the 30th anniversary to be celebrated next year in 2015. We are strong believers in the values of the United Nations, and as an institution of the United Nations University, Uno Wider exemplifies success in mobilizing research and dialogue to bring fresh, fresh ideas to the policy table. We all learn from each other. So thank you to CM, thank you to Uno Wider, and thank you to all of you for coming to Hanoi and making this conference a success. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I have a few sort of very practical things, and it's a kind of an anti-climax, but um, I have two people, uh, Pablo Celaya and Abel Quinonda. Could you please, before you run away, contact the conference office? Um, I have no idea what it may be. You might want to do it. It might be a ticket that's not there. Then I'd like to say that um, you might have been speculating about this thing here. W what is this all about? This is our attempt at trying to make sure that you remember the website, the conference event website, where you can actually find all of the presentations and all of the PowerPoints, all of the papers that have been made available the link is on this, web, on this thing here. And it's actually quite convenient to carry around. All of this will be available after the conference if it hasn't been put there already. And to stay in contact, to hear more about the wider research and various opportunities, uh, including PhD internships, visiting scholar program, and conferences, do sign up to the wider angle. We are trying to make that an active, dynamic, and interesting place to go. And for those of you who have gone to the website over the past sort of about a month or so, let me just say one thing. You will have seen that we've been trying to have a facelift. 
I mean, we've sort of had the same face for a while, and now we thought it was time. So if any one of you have gone there, and you've been frustrated because one or another link did not work the last few weeks, this is just part of the facelift, okay? It is now working. The next conference WIDER will be holding uh, is on inequality. Yes, inequality. WIDER is actually the home of the World Income Inequality Database. And the World Income Inequality Database has just been updated under the leadership of a Finn who is in the audience. We have managed to actually update it such that you will find inequality database all the way up to 2012. Take a look. The data is there. And I dare not mention a name that's mentioned everywhere these days, so I will leave that. But just say that in September, you will find on the website, you fill, if you monitor what's going on, you will actually find a lot of discussion, a lot of debates among the professional community focused on inequality. And then in November, there will be an, the wider annual lecture on structural transformation will be given by Professor Peter Timmer uh, in New York. Uh, you may want to follow that because it will be broadcasted. What's left for me now is to say, Sing come on to our Vietnamese partner in organizing this conference, Dr. Kung, Madame Hong, Sang, all of the CIM staff who have been here, Lien, all of you, and also to the wider support staff, Anna, Lumi, Tuli, Annette, Paul, Dominique, Brooke, Kennedy, Leipo, Marion, James, Lorraine, and I apologize if there was one that I missed. Thank you very much, and I would also like to say thank you to those who are taking all these pictures, who made sure that the lights were working at least most of the time, and thank you very much for organizing all of this, helping us make this possible. And then finally, thank you very much, keynotes. Thank you very much, speakers. Thank you very much, panelists. Thank you very much to all of you, and safe travel. Get home okay, and we will be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for organizing.